Have you ever had to interview for a job or gone on a blind date or had to give a presentation? If so, you're well aware of the importance of a first impression. But how do we make sure that a first impression we make is a great one? Hi, I'm Rich Burnett for Wondrium. And in this episode of Perspectives, we hear from a handful of experts on just that, the methods and psychology behind making a great first impression. We begin now with some tips for impressing a potential employer at a job interview. Spoiler alert, don't try too hard. Enjoy. Conveying information about one's knowledge, skills, and experience in a resume or application is usually straightforward because applicants can point to their educational history, certifications, and previous experience. But conveying an impression of being likable is more difficult. Although people sometimes do it by listing interests and activities that make them seem like a nice person. But most of people's efforts to appear likable occur during the job interview. And applicants do many of the same kinds of things to get the interviewer to like them that they do in other face-to-face -face interactions. For example, they laugh at the interviewer's jokes, try their hand at, at a little humor themselves, attempt to seem modest about their accomplishments, and they may even pretend to like the interviewer, whether they do or not. Anything that gives the impression that they're a nice, likable person. The challenge is that there's sometimes a trade-off between appearing likable and appearing competent. Research shows that the more people do things to make themselves seem likable, the less competent they may appear. And the more they try to look competent, the less they come across as friendly and likable. Both sets of impressions are important, and job applicants have to find the optimal mix. Do applicants' self-presentations and job interviews actually work in terms of increasing their likelihood of getting a job? Absolutely. Impression management can certainly backfire if people's self-presentations are obvious or clumsy. But studies show that self-presentation generally works. Employers want to hire competent, likable people. So applicants who purposefully say and do things to foster the impression that they're competent and likable are certainly more likely to be hired than applicants who don't. But research offers an interesting qualification of this finding. Applicants' self-presentations have a stronger effect on interviewers' impressions of them if the job interview is unstructured rather than structured. And impression management tactics in the interview context have been analyzed in other scholarly studies. For example, a 2002 study by Alex Ellis goes into a bit more detail about the importance of self-promotion and ingratiation in successful job interviews. For starters, Ellis breaks these two large categories into various specific tactics. For example, he breaks ingratiation into two specific tactics, opinion conformity and other enhancement. Opinion conformity refers to stating beliefs that one could reasonably assume the other person would also hold. Other enhancement is more straightforward flattery, saying something positive about that person. In addition, Ellis's study identifies a third broad category of impression management tactics called defensive tactics. Defensive tactics include excuses, justifications, and even apologies as ways to protect or repair reputation. Here's how the study worked. The researchers obtained audio tapes of practice interviews conducted by real employers. The interviews were conducted by different recruiters, but all involved the same 14 questions. 119 structured interview audio tapes were coded by two trained research assistants who listened carefully for the use of those tactics. What were the commonly used tactics and which worked best? Well, first, it's worth noting that all but three of this entire sample of interviewees used at least one of the impression management tactics, self-promotion, ingratiation, and defensive tactics. 
people were actively trying to manage impressions while answering interview questions. But which of those tactics worked? Both self-promotion and ingratiation tactics had a small, positive, and statistically significant correlation with interview evaluations. So using these tactics was associated with higher evaluations by the interviewer. Defensive tactics, on the other hand, had a much lower correlation that wasn't significant. Taken as a whole, this study suggests that in formal interview contexts, engaging in both self-promotion and a bit of opinion conformity is likely to create the most positive impression. The extent that you, as the job candidate, look attentive and enthusiastic about the job will help sway a personnel officer to select you for the job. So, all right, what does that attentive enthusiasm look like behaviorally? Well, as far as what you might need to do, Dr. Ronald Riggio says that your behavior is easy as pie. The word pie stands for poise, interest, and expressiveness, P-I-E, poise, interest, and expressiveness. You convey these pie qualities through an attentive forward lean, like you see in immediacy, confidence, looking people in the eye when you speak, but of course not staring in their eyes, more variation in your voice tone, and gesturing when you speak, and being expressive with your smiles, and just generally showing positive emotion, and not showing negative emotion even when you're talking about things like a hated former boss. Looking negative never helps. But of course, you cannot be so incredibly joyful and so positive that you seem like you're kind of psychologically unstable or manic, all right? But the opposite behaviors, leaning back, no eye contact, yawning, checking your watch, and the aforementioned negative behaviors can be job killers. And cell phone, leave it at home. But if you have to bring it, turn it off, and keep it out of sight. Those things will also be helpful. Audiences perk up and listen when you first start to talk, and they listen when it sounds like you are winding down. That moment when you first start to talk, that's called the moment of primacy. It's when you're making your first impression. The audience is getting oriented and deciding whether this speech is worth listening to or whether they'd rather check their messages on their phones. And they're not tired yet. They're all listening to the first few sentences. So take advantage of that moment. You'll want to spend some time thinking about a catchy way to start so that you are excited to deliver that opening. That can help with nerves so that you are projecting confidence, which helps with your ethos. If your opening is catchy and tells the audience how they're going to benefit from listening to your speech, then you're giving them a reason to care and starting to create that relationship with them, engaging them. That's pathos. And you will also want to begin the process of making your logical argument in the first paragraph of the speech by introducing the conclusion you plan to reach. Hit that theme from the very beginning. It's the first time they will hear it, and since they're listening, they will remember it. That's Logos. We also know that audiences listen to the end of the speech. It's the very last thing you say to them, so whatever you say then is also likely to stick with them. This is called the moment of recency, another place to hit your theme. We remember best the last thing that we hear. So you'll want to circle back to the central message you introduced in your moment of primacy. Social scientists have long known that humans, like other animals, express power through open, expansive postures. You could think about this in nature. If you're a peacock and you want to express power, you unfurl those feathers. Or if you are a lion, you shake your mane and you roar, you stalk around and take up space. You don't run and hide. You let the world know that you're there. Same with humans. Maya Angelou once wrote, stand up straight and realize who you are, that you tower over your circumstances. I love that. A psychologist named Amy Cuddy has studied the impact of body language in public speaking, and she's found that audiences make snap judgments about a speaker within the first two minutes of a speech based on what that speaker is doing physically. 
the speaker is using open, expansive postures, which she calls power poses, then the audience is more likely to assess them as credible. If instead the speaker is using closed, protective, submissive postures, then the audience is going to think that the speaker doesn't know what he's talking about. Those closed, submissive postures that undercut your credibility are the postures we retreat to when we're feeling scared and we need to soothe ourselves. Think about the small child curled up in a ball or the speaker with her, her arms and legs protecting her core. If you're shielding your core, it indicates that you feel under attack. Or sometimes you soothe yourself through repetitive motion. Think of that small child rocking back and forth, sucking her thumb. Or the speaker who rocks or fidgets or plays with hair or jewelry or clothes. All those habits can get in the way of your credibility. Now remember, pace is how quickly or slowly you speak. We typically measure pace in words per minute, and if we take silence and semantics into consideration, we can create a general guideline of an optimal English speaking pace at somewhere between 140 and 175 words a minute. But remember, typical speaking pace varies from culture to culture and from situation to situation. When you speak at a faster pace, you demand more of your audience. The audience has to work to keep up with you, which can be helpful in some instances. But if your pace gets too fast, as it often can when you're nervous, the audience might not be able to keep up. So if you feel your heart pounding before you begin to speak, remember to breathe deeply and remind yourself to take it slow. Now, going at a slower pace than the cultural norm can engage an audience and sometimes even surprise them. You get to choose what you think. If you catch yourself thinking negative thoughts, like this is gonna be a disaster, then stop yourself and try intentionally thinking another thought instead. Choose one that is true, that you can believe. You could try, I took the time to prepare for this. I have thought about who my audience is. I have something to offer them. I'm gonna offer it. Remember that this does not have to be a perfect show. If you have taken the time to think about the things we've been talking about, then your presentation is going to have value. You are going to be offering something worthwhile. Your audience is gonna benefit from the experience of listening to you. You are doing something to make the world a better place. Now, go to it, knock them dead, and have a great time while you're doing it. There is nothing quite like knowing you have something to say, saying it, and then listening to your audience cheer. And that is what I hope for you. Hey, thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about any of the topics in this episode, the full list of series that these clips came from is in the description below. You can watch all the full series now on Wondrium.com. And don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Turn on notifications and you'll get an alert every time we post a new episode of Perspectives.